So the talk that I'll be giving today is on standard bariatric procedures, the mechanisms and the techniques. It's actually supposed to be techniques mechanism, but I've done some reverse engineering. I'll talk on mechanisms that are common to all, almost all bariatric procedures. And then we'll see the techniques of three common, most common bariatric procedures that are usually done in India. So what changes after bariatric surgery? We all know that bariatric procedures, any bariatric procedures, procedure has a metabolic effect in addition to restriction with or without malabsorption. The weight loss is almost always accompanied by improvement in resolution or of improvement or resolution of comorbidities of the metabolic syndrome. That is T2 diabetes, the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, the polycystic ovarian syndrome, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and so many others. In general, bypasses effect a greater and sustained weight loss, but also come with higher complication rates and malnutrition. It is always prudent to measure the total small bowel length during any bypass so as to leave a common channel of at least 30% of the total small bowel length to minimize malnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies due to an ensuing malabsorption proximal. The gastric pouch is always created along the lesser curve as this is less likely to distend over time. The body weight homeostasis is influenced by hormones, peptides, microbes, etc. in the gut and adipose tissue. Their overall balance and interaction in the, in, in the hypothalamus affect food intake and energy expenditure. There's still more. Here come the hormones. In T2DM, remission begins soon after surgery, before even any evident weight loss. This is seen across the board, any bariatric procedure. There is rapid transit into the ileum, which causes an increased secretion of GLP-1 hormone, which causes increase of in insulin secretion, which is, known, which is called an incretin effect. This also leads to beta cell growth and increase in beta cell mass. It also slows the intestinal motility and delays gastric emptying called the intestinal break effect, which leads to early and prolonged satiety. PYY or the protein tyrosine tyrosine hormone or protein peptide is also secreted, which is similar to GLP-1 in its effect on GI motility. Apparently, this plays a greater role in weight loss, while GLP-1 mainly contributes to glycemic hemostasis or homeostasis. The importance and exact effects of other hormones or peptides like GIP, the glucose-dependent insulin or tropic peptide, secreted from the duodenum and proximal jejunum, the oxyntomodulin, which is secreted from the ileum, and polycystokinin remain poorly defined. The last one, promise. Ghrelin or the growth hormone releasing peptide. This is secreted mainly by the oxyntic glands in the gastric fundus. It is an orexogenic neuropeptide. This is in opposition or against something that is anorexogenic. So this is an orexogenic neuropeptide, which causes decrease in satiety in obese individuals, making them eat more. It inhibits glucose secretion and hence suppresses the adiponectin, which is secreted from the, uh, from the fat cells and is an insulin sensitizing hormone. And this has a negative effect on the glucose metabolism. The levels are much lower after LSG. So the ghrelin level falls to much lower after a sleep gastrectomy than after a gastric bypass. And that's how it probably plays its role in decreasing the, decreasing the satiety, decreasing the hunger cravings and increasing the satiety. Overall, this plays only a marginal role in sustained post-op weight loss. So after, after a year, two years, three years, this would probably not be as important as immediate post-op. There are three procedures I'd like to talk about mainly, which are commonly done. One is the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy or LSG. Second is the Rua-Y gastric bypass or the RYGB. And the third is the mini gastric bypass, which is also now known as the one anastomosis gastric bypass. Let's first talk about the sleeve gastrectomy. What are the technical considerations? One is the sleeve width. This can be BMI adjusted for lower BMI patients and is important, especially when you are doing surgery for purely metabolic reasons. 
like for type 2 diabetes a fundectomy the fundectomy should be a nearly co near complete fundectomy so that there is no post op dilatation and the effect of ghrelin or the you know removal of the effect of ghrelin is also as adequate or as near complete as possible and an antrectomy the antrectomy now is a bone of contention with people uh, resecting from between 2 cm to 5 cm from the pylorus depending on what effect they want but uh, what we find now is that the lesser distance you keep from the pylorus the more effective and the longer lasting is the sleeve gastrectomy if any of these are inadequately done it is going to lead to weight regain a loose elastic ring around the mid sleeve may improve long long term results pre existing gerd or gastroesophageal reflux disease is a strong indication for this procedure and this is probably the safest procedure with the least malnutrition then we come to rygb in this a 50 cc gastric pouch this is the gastric pouch a 50 cc gastric pouch is created along the lesser curve there is an elementary limb which may be anywhere between 75 to 150 centimeters the bp limb also may be anywhere between 75 to 150 centimeters the stoma size at the gj is about 2.5 centimeters it is important to close mesenteric defects meticulously with non absorbable suture banding the gastric pouch just above the anast just above the anastomosis there is no significant alteration of protein and carbohydrate absorption the restriction this procedure has restriction has duodenal exclusion and it also has calorie dense food that enters rapidly into the hindgut giving you all the hindgut effects like release of glp1 pyy etc there is an impressive excessive weight loss after 5 years and better long term control of type 2 diabetes compared to a, a sleep gastrectomy coming to the mgb or oagb the difference between the mgb and oagb is that there is a long lesser curve conduit right till the in so this is this tube is at least about 18 to 20 centimeters long there is an end to side anticholic anastomosis this is anticholic that's why you don't see this part of the uh, this part of the duodenal an anastomosis to a duodenal to a jejunal loop approximately 200 centimeters from 200 centimeters from the ligament of treats depending on the bmi an anti reflux suture can be added between this afferent loop and the gastric pouch to decrease the reflux and promote food passage into the efferent loop so it effectively straightens out this uh, straightens out this uh, loop so the food coming from here will by will by uh, uh, just by gravity go into the efferent loop rather than coming into the afferent loop then the bile reflux also may decrease because this is anti because this is anti gravity and the flow from the afferent to efferent loop becomes more uh, towards gravity the stoma size of about 4.5 to 6 cm allows for a free bile reflux this may be countered to some extent by the higher acid secretion from the long gastric pouch there is a lower propensity for weight regain and relapse of type 2 diabetes after the second post op year compared to an rygb and the long term anastomotic complications due to a greater acid secreting area lead to anastomotic ulcers which we are now dealing with more and more and this shows you the this diagram shows you the flow of food how it would how it would go from the from the stomach either into this loop or this loop but if you give if you apply a suture an anti reflux suture then the food will come from here and probably we don't know probably it will go into probably go into this loop by the preference